Alright, welcome to another edition of What the Fuck Happenings Here in Mendham. Uh, so I did notice a few things that I probably should notice more often is, you know, other people do say things, uh, and, you know, create product. And I don't pay much attention to all this stuff. I'm too distracted by all my own little internal arguments and whatnot. But anyway, there's a channel, high, Higher Entropy. And uh, she wrote uh, a nice little story, um, just uh, what you could call a fable or uh, I can't see. Look, brains, they get old and forget it. Um, can't really remember what, like, Little Red Riding Hood is kind of a story. I don't remember what the category it falls in, but that kind of thing. Some story that's supposed to have a message of some kind. And this one's a little more direct. It's not very subtle. Uh, you know, in terms of stepping on things and, uh, you know, what you do about that. So, um, it's, uh, there is a video of the, another video of the story that's on a channel called The Right to No Longer Exist. And so I'll link to this animated version and the original channel and, uh, such. Um, you know, it's it's kind of designed to, as a kid's story. That's sort of the effort. And, um, you know, it's not Red Riding Hood, but, you know, well, it's hard to even know how that took off, right? I mean, you could argue even the three bears is, you know, what? <laughs> you know, it doesn't really go anywhere. Uh, so anyway, um for what's worth and all that kind of stuff and to me it's you know it's definitely all that's the project here is really trying to get people to appreciate the dilemma of being um you know human and trying to figure out whether uh, it is really possible to uh, personally profit at somebody else's loss and do that and be ethical uh and that sort of brings us to the fact that uh, Amanda and um, Mari Hari uh, published their book, and um, it's got kind of a, you know, well, whatever title, Antinatalism, Extinction, and the End of Procreation Self-Corruption, which is <laughs> just like something you want to eat, but whatever. Um, and, um, you know, it's basically this question of, uh, you know, what really is our, um, to have integrity as a living being, what, you know, this whole blood footprint thing, this whole idea of having to be um, conscious that your life isn't your own, um, and that uh, there's broader implications, the real world will have a, an effect that you're going to be the cause of. And that's our reality. And uh, it's, it's a hell of a responsibility, frankly, um, trying to live an ethical, decent, pro, let's say productive life, being actually productive. And uh, just giving it a thought, you can sort of, you know, you might be able to figure out all on your own without me suggesting it, uh, that there's a lot more profit ground in fixing the broken stuff than there is in trying to invent some kind of new good thing. So if you want to do good in the world or get brownie points, um, you can get a lot of them by helping people out of quicksand than you can trying to build a bridge or something to some place <laughs> because there's really no place to go. So there's really just pulling people out of quicksand. Once you realize that's all your life really is, you know, that's all there is, is fixing what's broken, then you sort of figure out, well, how to get broken? Uh, oh, we showed up and we broke it. We broke the peace and quiet and uh, created a bunch of things that need to be taken care of. You know, if you don't make a baby, you don't have to feed the baby. <laughs> you know, you, you don't have to clean up after it. Uh, you know, you don't have to keep it warm. You don't have to do all those things. So it's uh, very economical uh, not to make the problem. And the problem is um, vulnerable, sensitive organisms, and they are very um, 
their uh, high maintenance and the maintenance end up being that they really are cannibalistic unfortunately that's it's in their nature and they will uh, you know make victory out of somebody else's defeat and that is uh, something you know an AI or something some sort of intelligent thing could figure out yeah that's not gonna work <laughs> you know that's uh, you know you can't do it that way you can't make money by um, you know burning money it's uh, you can't put money in the meat grinder and then think you're you know you've made a profit uh, so anyway, something like that. So that's the, what I did the video on was the book introduction, basically, and uh, some conversation about the how you know different people uh, f f how they draw it, how they view it, you know, how they shine light on it, and um, you know, I'm obviously more for a more direct you know finding something that's um somewhere in between red riding hood and war and peace you know something not too short not too long you know not too, too few words not too many words uh <clears throat> something like that whatever it's not a you know i'm just honestly interjecting it's not a critique and uh, Mari Hari's book is now available online for free. And uh, so this article... So I ought to be able to figure out how to post that link also. So in the thing, the description, which is not as obvious as it used to be, uh, it, I will leave the links. Maybe I'll just post a comment with the links, you know, that kind of thing. Quite, uh, quite a bit of... Uh, uh, fodder for a conversation there you go so yes it's just one more piece of stuff to sit there and say okay this is one way of of trying to get people to think about this bigger picture of your life isn't as simple as you think it is I mean no matter even if you're somebody like me who says something like that your life isn't as simple as you know you think it is I have to appreciate that I can't even appreciate how complicated it is I can't you know even knowing that doesn't you know it's not gonna it's not gonna make it so you can live a perfect life it's just gonna give you this um, oppressive understanding that gee you know I you know I don't squish every snail I step on um, I don't make sure everything is um, done right and proper so to speak. I don't think about, oh, did I hurt their feelings and blah, 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 and was it totally unnecessary because there was no point to be made, blah, blah, you know, some all this thinking that you're supposed to do constantly about worrying about what every single word is going to cause some sort of reaction, and um, it's kind of impossible to live careful enough or more aware, woke enough. It's There's no such thing as, you know... <laughs> being enough awake all right uh, but it's not exactly where I want it positioned there we go that's a little better um, so anyway we, let's play this so yeah I'm not in love with the title so I'll say that much and uh, <laughs> well whatever uh, moving on so um, before the the book has attached to it a audio uh, video of the abstract and so that's sort of interesting so that was very good a very little quick overview of anti-natalism now I'd prefer to be an overview of the more direct statement that all the things that have the little round head thing on them you know all the things with a brain uh, require our um, attention uh, we have to recognize that they are a value vessel that they're carrying this capacity to have a value experience and that all of the things with that little neural package of I can do the ouch thing so anything that can do the ouch thing <laughs> you know so the ouch is here um, but it needs to be the thing that you're really drawing is the ouch you know it's not what how many legs the ouch has 
it's you know just about the ouch the the negative conscious experience and the fact is that's the that's the bad substance in the environment and we're supposed to try to be filters and our our you know cleansers or however you want to describe it and we're trying to extract as much of that negative out of existence as possible that's the rational imperative is that um, your own brain is telling you I feel I, I want to feel better I want to feel good I don't want to feel bad so I mean the agenda is clear that and you want that quite rationally. Of all the things you want, that is the most rational and lucid of the statements you can make is, I don't want to, and then, you know, fill in the blank with some kind of unpleasantness. Uh, you know, I don't want to experience uh, pain and suffering. I mean, it's not very complicated. And because I don't want to, I know the other sentient beings don't want to. And... Um, just as much as I would panic if pain and suffering was coming at me, I should be panicking because it's coming at them. Because I can't really come up with a good rational reason why I should think me being in pain is any different than them being in pain. As an event in what we call the universe. Uh, but really, there's <laughs> the universe is just the surface of the planet of the Earth, frankly. It's the only place this is happening. <laughs> you know, I hate to say the words, trust me, but yeah, this is the only place it's happening. All right, continuing. We answer these questions. The ancient Greeks, influenced by other cultures, realized that human So that's part of the story. I mean, they're trying to tell the story of um, what you might think, uh, might, you, might, might call this kind of, uh, you know, not pessimistic, but, uh, you know, uh, not um, positive, <laughs> you know, um, perception of um, what we're doing here. And so for thousands of years, there have been a few people that stood up and said, you know, this really sucks. <laughs> Um, damn, you know, I, I, we should, we should be able to do better than this. We need to live in something better than this. We need to build something better than this. You know, all those kind of statements. And they've struggled with it for thousands of years of trying to figure out, you know, how do you do that? And, you know, they've done the cheaty thing where they just reach for, you know, they go ask a shark to do it. You know, they make a shark into a god and say, okay, shark god, We'll feed you, and you know we'll throw you some virgins, and you know, <laughs> for whatever reason they had to be a virgin, I don't know, and um, you know then you'll make things okay for us, right? And so whatever totem pole they throw it at, the volcano or the shark or Jehovah, you know, doesn't matter. They do their sacrificing. So you know, even the Christians waste time with their notions of you know, let's cut something's balls off for God. Uh, just kind of ridiculous. Well, not kind of ridiculous. It's just uh, insanely ridiculous. Uh, I don't know if that's even relevant, but whatever. Um, the fact that the conventional thinking, okay, the... Mo so, yeah, so the, the convention isn't opposing anti-natalism. They're trying to create um, a positive stomping ground. They want to do something, and they don't want it to be just pulling people out of quicksand. They want to think about it as being something positive. They want to, they want something more feel goody, um, and um, you know, than just some mediocre kind of solution. So you could say that even in writing stories, I mean. They always ended them with happily ever after. You know, they lived happily ever after. And they never showed really that, you know, she died of cancer and then he was a drunk and then this happened and that. You know, they never show the real story and how bleak and horrid it is. Um, because they want something <clears throat> not negative. And so they're going to, you know, they're going to keep trying to force the story not to be fundamentally negative. So it's the whole silver lining crap you know, some sort of positive talk because it feels better to have a positive incentive to do something, um, a candy incentive, some sort of dessert 
thing versus the nasty vegetables. And it's just sort of childish. You could just argue that that's just human beings showing their immaturity, the fact that they can't uh, elevate their their philosophical conversation to being uh, more rigorous and adult. So they wallow in a bunch of wishful thinking. Uh, something like that. Personal concept. Yeah, which is just stupid. It's like saying there should be no America. You know, it'd be nice just not to have countries. Um, so, yeah, so it's uh, sort of making the point that people are just reactionary. So because you um, try to make it understood that, you know, ideally it'd be so much more efficient... It's like explaining mass production or something. You could explain, well, look, the machines will do this and this will be that and it'll be very efficient. You'll make more cars and then they'll start thinking, but, but I won't be as important and my job won't be as important. I won't be as, you know, and they're starting to impersonally say, well, what's my role in that new agenda? So they don't care that the new agenda makes uh, life better for a bunch of people who couldn't afford a car or now be able to afford a car. They're just thinking about, well, what's in it for me and how does it affect me? And I don't like change. And even if the change is positive, I just don't want to do this changing thing. I like doing my job at the potato chip factory and I don't want to have some new job. <laughs> you know, um, I don't want to have to do something else. It's, it's risky and dangerous. So that's the funny part is that they can see the risk and danger when it's going to affect them more directly, but they can't see the risk and danger in endorsing having a baby for which you don't know what's going to happen. We have lots of advantages. So yeah, let's go with that. And then let's take care of these poor animals that are being uh, kicked out of nests. <laughs> you know, let's stop that from happening because it's all right, so I don't know what the advantages part was, but obviously the agenda's really got to be eventually um, it, just the recognition that you know as much as we, as much as again people just evade it. It's like the retarded human thing and the insane human thing, and these are all stuff you know the homeless people. You just kind of forget that they exist. You know the defective things, and um, n neglect any responsibility to them. And the animals are in the same position in the sense there's some sort of degraded, uh, you know, second-class citizen, so to speak, uh, for which it's not your problem or you didn't make the mess, therefore you don't have to clean the mess up. And it's just the wrong, it just doesn't, it doesn't fit with the facts. The fact is, is that, yes, none of it was your fault, but the fact is the future is going to be your fault. And the fact is, is that all of those um the 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 reality is is that you have the ability to prevent and rescue and the question is are you going to do it they're in the quicksand are you going to pull them out uh, or are you going to be preoccupied with some other fluffy nonsense it's just as real a victim i guess it's the whole poster child thing or something you know some people won't give money to a charity unless the kid starving is cute enough you know if it's not a cute kid then nah, it's not a story i mean there's probably been lots of kids murdered right and that little benet ramsey thing <laughs> you know everybody just was obsessed with because she's cute she's pretty and then you know it's so if you're an ugly kid it's okay if you get molested and murdered you know just kind of bullshit right yeah it's kind of bullshit because that perfect world would, you know, it's, you can't satisfy us with some kind of, let's just... All right, right. So this is the part where, you know, it's just, it's just kind of a joke that even if I gave you everything you want, I made you, you know, I just kept satisfying your desires, you would, you would realize that, um, gee, it's never enough somehow. So it just doesn't matter. Uh, I'll go into my, you know, Hollywood syndrome of uh, I need more, I need more, I need more. I mean, that's how people become insanely high maintenance. It's like, well, we're spending $100 a day to keep me alive, let's spend 200. And once you're spending 200, you're looking and seeing, well, there's other people that are worth 300. And then there's other people worth 400, you know, and it just goes on and on. And so it's not satiable. The 
fact is our eyes seek the flaws in our environment, um, the inadequacies, the insufficiencies. Everything isn't gold-plated. Uh, you know, I can't live in a world where everything isn't gold-plated. Uh, you know, so we always find, oh, there's a scratch on that one. You know, that has some dust on it. Uh, so, you know, even if you get what you want, you're going to want something more. And that should also be um, just a fact of life that people, it occurs to them that, yes, there is this tendency where even if I have what I want, you know, um, I get tired of it or I get bored with it or I start to see defects in it, you know. And it just absolutely sucks. I mean, it's a part of our existence that's just so strange. I, you know, to me, it's one of those things where you just, oh, that is bleak. Because, you know, you get what you want and you find out, ah, it turns out that's not what I wanted, actually. Something, I wanted something else because this, this isn't working either. Death. <laughs> okay, if you're risking that your child might die, uh, which it will, you know, it's not much of a, it's kind of a guarantee, not a risk, but it's, even if it's just a risk, it's one hell of a thing to be imposing. Yeah, so even that should just be, you shouldn't have to say much about the fact that just to um, obnoxiously tell somebody else that it'll all be all right, it's okay, I, I, you know, I'm good with it, so I'm sure you'll be good with it. Uh, you know, uh, you're going to be lucky. I'm sure you're going to be lucky. It's not going to be a terrible, horrible, awful, torturous death. No, no, no. You'll be lucky. I mean, it's just such an empty statement. It's so meaningless in terms of recognizing the real jeopardy and the fact that if the worst does happen, how do you account for it? I mean, how do you... You can't fix it. There's nothing you can pay back. And so why take such a risk? I mean, you shouldn't be risking things you can't clean up. And you just can't clean up hurting something else. And how as I see it is much more of a straight line. I just don't see the... Yeah, so that's sort of, uh, you know, all a bunch of... Uh, again, I'm not saying it should be two pages. I'm not saying the story should be told in five minutes. Um... But, yeah, you should be able to do it in two hours, <laughs> you know, something like that, uh, a movie. You should, you should be able to get uh, to most all of the necessary themes, it seems, uh, through some sort of conversational dialogue. Um, I can imagine that. But, you know, there is a lot of subtlety. So there is a lot of subtleties to, you know, the background information. You can't just, again, I can't just say the word evolution and expect that, every listener gets it you know that they see the bloody tree you, you know that they see how much evolution has cost the, the whole process of sending out you know a thousand children with the expectation that the environment will kill them and they'll kill each other you know to have this little war game that will produce the little tiny number of winners who will be stronger you know, than all the losers. And that somehow that fight will be fair and that the actual winner will actually be stronger when maybe all it will be is a carrier of a new disease. <laughs> you know, it just gave everybody a disease. You know, uh, yeah, it's just... Uh, so, so, yeah, so the story is more complicated because you do have to rely on people understanding some kind of actual, real context. So you really do have to defeat the notion that a god is going to come to the rescue, that there is some singularity or some heaven or some bullshit place that you're going to go to and everything will be just fine. And so all this torture was okay because everything's just fine in heaven. Uh, you know, that kind of nonsense. Uh, you know, and just recognize that all we are is these, this AI, this synthetic machine that has been created by a chemical process <laughs> and we're just a smart piece of chemistry we're just bacteria with brains and um, we have to use them we have them we have this huge 
advantage in having brains. It makes us being able to solve problems a lot better. We have a lot higher chance of solving problems because we can actually do logic and think and be rational. So uh, we kind of have an obligation to do that and quit fantasizing and daydreaming and doing a bunch of wishful thinking. We have to accept the dilemma. This is a tragedy that shouldn't be relived, okay? You shouldn't keep making Titanics because it just doesn't work out very well. That's a big one right there. We don't have permission to do something stupid, reckless, and idiotic uh, when we're on a crashing plane. <laughs> We have an obligation. Ah, so that's part of the whole Ethelism thing. You know, it's really not about us finding our way of ejecting because everything is in the system. The system is the problem. And the system's going to make a new pilot, <laughs> okay? And it's going to be a new pilot, and it's going to be a bunch of passengers, and it's going to be a bunch of train wreck. And your responsibility is that, well, we have the intelligence. We're the smart organism. We can't bail out of the plane. So whatever we do as individuals, we have to do it for more than just humanity. We have to do it for the passengers. And what we're going to do as a kind, humankind, is again obligated not to say, well, what's best for human beings? It's what's best for all of the sentient life on Earth. Um, yeah, it's a little yellow bus and there's a bunch of, you know, not too bright people sitting in the chairs behind you, but how smart they are doesn't have anything to do with how much suffering they're going to do. It really doesn't. You know what kind of crap happens. You know. And you're just, this is where I add a gigantic pile of risk to the equation. I drop these keys and I. I, I, so I was talking about just even being a parent. You could make a whole movie just about, you know, somebody who was risk averse having kids and just how miserable and awful their life would be because, frankly, every single thing the kid does is going to scare you to death. Every time they go out in some adventure, you know, and I, so I was just illustrating that point where, uh, you know, parents have to do this thing of giving the car keys to their kid. And I just don't know how you. I just don't know how they could sleep that night, so to speak, or how they, how they do that with any peace of mind at all, uh, knowing that that's this is. I've just added a big pile of shit to the dice. Okay, the dice had some bad dots on them, and I've just painted a bunch of dots red. You know, and now the rolling of the dice is going to. It's getting more and more serious, and there's more and more danger. And um, <clears throat> I just don't know how they live with having just walk around as if they didn't make the decision. I mean, you know, even just little things. I mean, you know, um, as a kid, you know, I started riding mini bikes and motorcycles. And, um, <laughs> you know, it did bother my mother. Um, didn't bother my father at all. And it's just, you know, I'm just thinking for me personally, I'm saying, shit, I knew who, what a fucking asshole I was. I mean, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't let a kid, do, uh, no way. It's not going to happen. And I know how many times I came really close to fucking up, you know, foobar in. So what the, what, you know, to me, it's almost like a, a moot conversation because I wouldn't let my kid cut the grass and I wouldn't let him drive a car. And uh, no, it wouldn't happen. Because I know I didn't do it well, well enough, let's just say. I mean, I got a car, you know, I had, a, I, I, for a while I had a, a, a Camaro a convertible, an old one, you know, real nice, like a 68, 67, something like that. Anyway, you know, it has speedometer went up to 160, you know, that's, you know, the kind of car it was. Um, and, um, you know, I did drive faster than I should have, and more importantly, I suppose, uh, I drove at night a lot, and, you know, you just kind of assume there's no deers in the street, and you assume that no cars coming because there's so few, and you cut corners, and so I guess that's the word to use. I did cut corners, and when I think back to it, I say, that was, uh, that was a disaster waiting to happen. 
because that cut corner, if there was actually another car coming, there were circumstances where I can diagram them now and realize that was an insanely stupid thing to do because you wouldn't have been able to get out of that trouble. You would either have to drive into a tree or they would be forced in. You know, there would be some kind of tragedy. It wasn't going to end well. And so just having those experiences, you know, shit, I could not be. You know, how the fuck could I ever think my kid was uh, smarter than me at his age? That kind of crap, right? I, I, you know, how, <laughs> you know what, what, what test would he have to take and pass before I'd say, um, yeah, he's not going to cut corners. He's not going to do it sloppy or he's not going to, he's going to know what he's doing before he's had practice doing it. Right? That we all need to practice. So, you know, the, uh, anyway, so that's just one little subject. That's just a little, one little piece of this puzzle in terms, and it's not even the important piece in that it's not really the moral or ethical argument. It's the simple practical argument that if you have any character at all, how can you even think about being uh, making these decisions? You're going to imprison your children based on your paranoia, or you're going to be so casual and indifferent um, that you're going to set up the disaster. You're going to ruin them because you're just not going to be worried enough. I mean, how do you win? I just don't see, the, the, I don't see how the parent propagandizes that, oh, it's so in, it's so enriching. It's so enriched my life, you know, to play this dice game uh, with my own children. Oh, fuck you. I mean, that's, you know, if that makes you happy, you are a fucking cunt. All right. All right I don't know why I did that. I don't think I was at the total end. I guess it's saying that is the end. All right, so good enough. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so some links provided, and um, the book will be interesting. Um, so I haven't read it yet, you know, and uh, I'll get to it, <laughs> you know. And uh, the more importantly, like I said, what I'd like to do is is reduce it, okay, to. Um, something more in line with my focus, which clearly is just the Ephelist argument and the imposition argument. That the real, the real killer argument for any of this idea that it's okay to propagate the existence of sentience is that it is too impositional. It's a rape. It's a, you can't force something else to serve your agenda. It is a slavery. And that is the corruption. That's the real ethical crime of the procreator, <clears throat> is the enslavement. Uh, something like that, anyway. Oakley Doke. So, till the next time and such. I think that's enough. Uh, uh, I have a <laughs> stiff neck. It's really... Uh, it's really... Such a little thing, but it is so, you know, you really need your neck. You know, it's, you take it for granted, you know, you don't pay enough attention. And uh, then all of a sudden it fails you and it's like, oh, shit. Uh, but anyway, till the next time and such and so forth and whatnot.